northern cardinal, brown-headed cowbird. Uh, I couldn't tell if it was a tanager or a grosbeak. Carolina wren. Another Carolina wren, red-bellied woodpecker. There's, there's a start. It gets worse, right? Like a couple weeks ago, peak migration. Um, I, I just do a lot of ear birding and I do a lot of surveys by ear and I've spent a lot of time. So here's something just to know and, th and then I want us to get back and moving is that uh, if, if you sing me a song or I listen to like a Beatles song that I love or something like that, I don't know the words. I don't know where the pitch goes. I don't have a natural knack for picking up songs like a lot of my friends do. A lot of my friends sing a song once or twice or 10 times and they get it. I can sing a song 30 times and I don't get it. I've put in a lot of practice and, and just listen to CDs over and over and over. Um, I do have keen hearing and my ears do a pretty good job of picking things out from a complex soundscape. But just to say like, if you're like, oh, he has a special knack, like I think I just put in a lot of practice hours and you can do that too. Start small, you know, learn five birds at first, increase to 10 birds. And um, there's a lot of resources these days to hear bird songs. And uh, it gets really fun, it gets really fun, yeah. I don't think I've ever heard so many birds at one time. Isn't it great? If we got up um, at about 5.51 this morning, we would have got to hear the dawn chorus and we would have heard many birds singing all at the same time. And that can be a difficult situation. I like it aesthetically. I never try to really teach during the dawn chorus because there's just, you know, there'll be 40, 50 species all singing at the same time. And for most folks to try to pick individual songs out of that is just confusing. But, but forget trying to think about the dawn chorus. It's this experience on our planet, happens every day somewhere. And it's just, it's just a beautiful thing. Can you suggest a method or an app for if you hear a new bird song that you're hearing frequently around your house to identify it? Um, just to, to figure out, okay, that, one, that one's like a high pitch or that one has like eight notes or... Right, how can you take the sound and get the sound identified? There's, there's folks working on that where if you have a recording, it will make some guesses for you. Uh, but the technology isn't up to snuff yet. And what happens to me, I could show you on my phone almost every day, people call me or send me a text or a voicemail. Luke, it sounds like this. What is that one? Do you know that one? I'll play some for you. They're just really, they're really fun, yeah. I should mention there is a search function for sound on the Audubon app. It's, oh. it's still a little bit confusing to use. Yeah. Did you say you have tanagers? Yeah, scarlet tanagers. Uh, I, I thought I heard one in the distance. A beautiful scarlet bird with dark wings is the male. The female is kind of a yellow green with a stout beak. They specialize in eating bees. And so as I start to see uh, honeysuckles blooming and the tulips, as the tulip trees are opening their blossoms, I just go hang out by a blooming tulip or a basswood and you'll get tanagers coming in just to eat the bees off of them. Let's walk a little more and see what we see. So there's a bird singing up here that has a lot of different notes to it and it keeps changing. It's a bird that's in the family of the mockingbird called the mimidae, but this one is called the gray catbird. And you might just hear all sorts of different sounds and notes that it's making. Guess what kind of habitat the gray catbird likes? Thickets, right? Dense thickets where it skulks around. This is an all gray bird, except for a little black cap and a little reddish burgundy patch on its bum. It's not as good of a mimic as the mockingbird or the brown thrasher, um, but it is in their family. Maybe we'll see it fly as we walk in that new way. So he's perched up in a high place rather than taking cover. So we know he's feeling safe. There's a lot of behaviors we can observe in birds. And 
One thing that a lot of bird watchers will do, especially folks getting into bird language, is divide them into two big categories. One category is baseline, and that's a term that means the bird feels safe. Everything, it's either eating or cleaning its feathers or finding food or singing a song or making a nest. All of those things say, I'm feeling relatively, relatively safe in the moment. Uh, if a bird, however, is standing still, frozen, um, making alarm noises, uh, or in immediate retreat, those are all things that are telling us the bird isn't feeling safe. Um, kind of obvious, but things to pay attention to. In this case, this catbird out in the open at a zenith perch, right, at the highest part it can be, wanting to show itself. It's not feeling like there's a cooper's hawk or a a sharp shin hawk about to swoop in and snatch it up. We could watch for a while and see, is he patrolling a territory? Or is he just staying in one spot, maybe hoping that some other female catbird with long eyelashes and nice toes uh, is in the area? One thing that's been shown with the Mimidae family is that one of the ways they use song is to show their vitality. Brown Thrasher is another mimic, and it's kind of the champion of like the most diversity of songs. If a brown thrasher lives to be four or five years old, it may have as many as three or four thousand song varieties that it uses. So it's taking bits of other birds' songs, even its own original things, and remixing them in thousands of different patterns. It turns out that female brown thrashers will preference males who know more song types, more song variety than those who know only like 900 or 1,700, you know, not that impressive. But if you, if you know two or three or 4,000 different song types, you're potentially showing the females, uh, it probably took you a while to learn them, it's letting them know that like you're smart and you've been around for a while. You probably know how to survive. And then a female is going to deduce that if I mate with this person, we might be more likely to carry our young forward. Because one of the important things for us to know is that raising a young is, is a dangerous and often not successful activity for songbirds. For some species, it's only about 50% that will ever make it to be one year old, right? There's, there's a, a lot of chance that your young will die. That's the biggest chance that a, a bird will die is in its first few weeks of its life. If it makes it to year one, it will likely make it to year four or five. Um, but, but making it to year one, is making it even to two months old is uncommon because when you're on the nest, you're vulnerable. So jumping into ecology a little bit, one of the things for us to know is that um, likely one of the main reasons why a lot of birds leave the tropics and come up to temperate North America, that's a big journey. Thousands of thousands of miles traveled by a little teeny bird uh, every year. The main purpose is to raise their young. Just like we go down to the tropics for winter, <laughs> they, came up here, they come up here to raise their kids to raise their young. And, and there's one, there's a number of reasons for that, but there's one big primary reason for it, which is abundance of caterpillars. Abundance of caterpillars in the temperate area. Not only that, but predictable abundance of caterpillars. In the temperate areas, we have leaf out happening at a predictable time. And when the leaf out is happening, um, many, many Lepidoptera, uh, moths and butterfly caterpillars are all coming out at the same time. And so you just have this immense area full of food. And caterpillars are such amazing, rich food sources. They are just concentrations of vitamins and minerals and protein and fat all in one. Like if you want like to go on a new superfood, big muscle diet, just go for caterpillars. <laughs> um, I don't actually have experience myself eating caterpillars, but the birds do. They're literally flying thousands of miles in order to have caterpillar feasts, not just because they like the flavor, but because time is of the essence. Every single day, their young are in the nest as eggs or as uh, uh, fledglings or, or, or hatchlings. Um, every single day that that young bird is in the nest, 
it's risking losing its life. They want that part of the process to happen as fast as possible. In order to do that, they need to have as amazingly rich, uh, mineral-rich foods as they can, energy-rich foods as they can. That's why they're going for caterpillars. So here's a piece to tie it into ecology and native plants that's really important, is that most Lepidopteran species, moths and butterflies, things that make caterpillars, most of them are host-specific or at least family specific, but often there's only a few species that they're gonna lay their young on. And those plants are native plants. If you have a big field of a non-native plant, such as autumn olive or Japanese knotweed or kudzu, um, unfortunately, even though those might produce things that we can use, we can feed our goats, uh, they might, autumn olives have delicious berries. Matter of fact, even the birds love to eat the berries of autumn olives. They help spread autumn olive all over the place. However, when autumn olive takes over an entire patch of native habitat or a native ecosystem, then when the birds come back the next year and would like to raise their young, they won't be able to find food in that area because there aren't any caterpillars that are being laid and raised on autumn olive because it's a non-native species. So we need native plants in order to support young bird populations. Does that make sense? So even if a bird is eating privet berries and benefiting from it in migration in the fall, eating autumn olive berries, in the springtime, when it's time to raise their young, our populations are going to plummet if we have big non-native species impact. We need to be storing for native species as much as we can. So we've got Canada geese in the background. Oh, you've got a second one too? Okay. Oh, I see her, I see her now, yeah. Oh, she's, she's preening, yeah, she's cleaning her feathers. Only about six or seven feet off the ground. No, she's being quiet. Is that yeah, common that they'll be yeah. kind of directly beneath each other like that? Or in the vicinity of one another, yeah. All right, let's mosey a little bit more. We have, Don't a, you have a good sense of smell. Most of our songbirds have very little sense of smell. Um, turkey vultures, on the other hand, fantastic smell. Uh, uh, crows, I understand, have pretty good sense of smell. A lot of birds that are prone to um, eating carrion, they'll, they've developed good sense of smell. Oceanic birds have incredible senses of smell, uh, but often for particular things. There'll be certain pheromones or certain scents that can travel hundreds of miles and be detected by things like storm petrels or, or uh, pelagic birds. I'll mention those cedar wax wings as we walk. So one of the things you learn as you learn groups of birds is that different species actually carry different traditions. I would even say that they have different culture. There is the cedar wax wings. Sometimes when the lighting is right, you can see that bright yellow tail. Sometimes if you get a good close look, you'll be able to see uh, these nice little red waxy dots on their wings. And if you ever actually find a feather of a cedar wax wing, it does feel like it's a little bead of wax on the feather. I had a friend that, um, that uh, had a cedar wax wing crash into her window and, and, and not make it. And she ended up taking some of the feathers and making little earrings out of them, which I think is illegal by the way, but little black mask, nice thin pointy bill, a little bit of red, um, buffy breast and a bright yellow tail stripe. From a distance, sometimes they can just look gray they have a high-pitched call note that's too high for some, some birders to hear. Um, it's like just on the edge of our, a lot of our auditory range, uh, but it's a beautiful sound, and when you learn to hear it, you'll see a lot more cedar wax wings. This is a beautiful regal bird that travels all around. It doesn't just migrate north and south. It kind of roams in these big groups anywhere where there's like good fruit and good berries and anywhere it can get drunk off fermenting berries. That's where it likes to go. And you will see when the June berries are ripening and becoming overripe, that the cedar wax wings will just be literally flying around like hiccuping and like drunk off of fermented berries. Uh, they really love the June berries or service berries. And pooping them on your car. And pooping them on your car, yeah. Yeah, the Ingalls parking lot in Weaverville has a number of June berries in it. And uh, I have 
had my car parked there for bird survey days and I come back and my car is good luck is, is what they say. It's good luck. Um, beautiful bird. Uh, they often like to fly in groups of about 10 to 30. Sometimes I see them in groups of 100 or 200, but just to say most of the time I see them in a group of 10 to 30. Kind of a specific quantity. And that can be really helpful because I only know a few other groups of birds that like to fly in small groups where they're close together like that, that fly in groups of 10 to 30. One of those would be pigeons. And do you think you would mistake this little bird for a pigeon, right? You'll see pigeons flying around in groups of 10 or 30, which is like, oh, it's not that. Another one would be European starlings. They can be in groups of thousands, but occasionally you'll get one in a group of about 20 or 25 or something like that. Starlings have a particular wing shape that I've learned to look for. They also have a little bit of a different flight pattern than the cedar waxwings. They also are a dark bird with a bright yellow beak. So if I can rule out starling, I'm getting closer and closer to cedar waxwing as being my most likely suspects. Uh, there's a few other things in there, but like as you begin to see what habits or traditions different species carry, it'll help you a lot with identification. Um, again, a group of cedar waxwings flying by often only takes me a few seconds to narrow it down to possibly being waxwings. And then if I just hear one little call note somewhere as they're crossing the sky, I know, boom, there's 25 cedar waxwings. Um, can be nice for surveying. What's really nice though is when you've planted uh, mulberries in your yard or you have a nice black cherry or a June berry, in one of these native berry species, and they just come and perch and hang out in your yard for like a few days and, uh, and you get to look at them up close. The Carolina wren over here going bit a doo bit a doo bit probably the same one, different song. Jab, jab. That is a blue jay doing one of its alternate calls. Blue jays are one of the members of the corvids and they have a huge vocabulary and they're tricksters too. They'll try to use their different calls to like fool other birds, either making them think it's really safe when it's not or it's not safe when it is so they can go and get the berries or try to get their to their eggs. Now are they unique in eating other birds eggs or is that? They're not unique in it but they r seem to do it more often than a lot of other birds. It's a regular pursuit for them. And we've got a blue jay. Now blue jays, males and females, look identical. With blue jays, we're almost always hearing different calls of theirs. Rarely do we hear their song. In Riceville, I was gardening and I heard this amazing songbird singing this incredibly beautiful warble. And I looked and it was actually in a pine tree. It was in a white pine. It sounded like it was coming from a white pine, but I couldn't see the songbird. I couldn't locate it. Um, all I could see was there was one Phoebe going back and forth from my shovel to the ground getting worms, and there was a blue jay up in there. And, but this songbird was somewhere in that pine tree making this beautiful song, and I just kept looking for it and looking for it. And all of a sudden, at one point, I focused in on the blue jay, and I saw it was the blue jay singing this quiet, beautiful, soft song. I mean, it was as sweet as a rose-breasted crow's peak. It was just absolutely beautiful. And I was like, I didn't know, oh my God, I had no idea. And I've talked to a number of other birders since who say, yeah, occasionally, right in early mating season, they'll sing these sweet little sonnets, you know, these sweet little like love songs to try to attract a mate. Or sometimes it's actually when the mate is on the nest, the male will sing to the female while she's sitting on the nest. What a sweet little romantic thing. So on the right is a catbird, on the left is another catbird. And there's a hawk in the background. And this hawk is actually a predator bird. This is a cooper's hawk. And a cooper's hawk is flying up and over us here. And notice most of the song is totally silent right now. What we're seeing in the top of that tree is a northern mockingbird. And that the little bird that flew in for just a moment, I think might have been a swallow, but I couldn't get a good angle on it. So I'm taking back saying it's a catbird. It's one of the catbird relatives. Another gray bird is not as dark as the catbird. It's a lighter gray. It has a longer tail and a little stripe across the eye. This is a northern mockingbird. I hear a catbird now in the distance going, meh, meh. 
It was a morning dove. <clears throat> the catbird on top is a little smaller than the northern mockingbird. If the northern mockingbird flies, we should be able to see a little white in its tail and these nice white wing spots underneath the wings. And in terms of their song and the variety of song, is, there, I mean, is that fairly easy to distinguish since they're all mocking? Uh, with the mockingbirds, they usually repeat something, whether it's another bird or something they've just kind of patched together three times or more, sometimes six times even. The brown thrasher usually repeats things in couplets or pairs, doublets. Sometimes it does it once, sometimes it does it three times, but most of the repeats you hear will be in couplets. Gray catbird is just making all sorts of noises. Here's a noise, here's another noise, here's another. It's not repeating them. So brown thrasher usually repeating things in couplets. Northern mockingbird usually three or more times. Does that make sense? We've had tree swallows flying <clears throat> over us, uh, which have quite a kind of shorter tail that is two-parted, but just barely. Sometimes it doesn't even look, part of it just looks truncate. And then this barn swallow has longer two points coming off of its tail. If we had a little more light, we'd be able to see that they both have blue tops, the tree swallow and the barn swallow. But the barn swallow has a buffy, warm colored breast, a little bit orangey. And the tree swallow has an all white breast. This is a swarm trap over here in this tree by the hives to catch bee swarms and a family of tufted titmice have set up, set up home there. A swarm trap is to catch bees if they decide to book it out of their original hive and, and a new queen is leading folks to another place. They'll be like, hey, look, right here, there's this huge, beautiful cavity right in this tree, right nearby, perfect. So you won't lose one of your swarms when they divide. In this case, the tufted titmouse, cavity dweller, has said, hey, look, this little maple tree has this great big cavity in it, perfect. It's even near a food source. We can eat some bees if we want to. There's the tufted titmouse just to the left of the swarm trap in a branch and down about six inches. When I was catching the swarms, the tufted, there was a tufted titmouse that was just like bouncing around everywhere, not shy about me, really interested in the activity, and it was fun to watch them. Tufted titmouse is a bird we're going to talk about later this afternoon. We'll talk about multi-species flocks. And the tufted titmouse and the Carolina chickadees, they're actually in the same family. They're often buddies. They hang out together a lot. And kind of like we might have been in our early teens, they can be a little bit dramatic together too. They chat a lot. They gossip a lot. And as they fly about uh, the woodlands or the hedgerows, they talk quite a bit. Matter of fact, they kind of make commentary on everything they see. So tufted titmouse, Carolina chickadee, both cavity dwellers, both are like the baton holders of a multi-species flock. They're the birds that are going first and lots of other species will be following them through the woodlands or the hedgerows and eating food together. We'll talk about multi-species flocks later. One cool little fact about those two birds, Carolina chickadee and tufted titmouse, is that sometimes in, on a really cold, cold snap and, and a cold night of a winter, if there's only so many cavities available, they'll actually nest up together. They'll, all, they'll use the same cavity together just to stay warm. Uh, so they're close enough friends that they'll warm each other up and, and survive through a night by huddling together. I thought that was super cute. I got to see that one time up in New York. Um, I was doing a walk with the Lab of Ornithology up there and we got to sit and watch uh, a black capped night heron for some time giving us really nice views and it was in breeding plumage and we were all just so amazed and then we kept walking down the road and I ended up seeing a chickadee and a titmouse both go in and out of the same cavity in a little buckthorn there was a hole in the buckthorn and I was just amazed and uh, I kind of ended up using it as a litmus test to see who in the group had the same kind of birding style as I did because I would say oh there's titmice and chickadees over here coming in and out of a cavity. And there was a few folks who were like, chickadees and titmice, those are beginner birds. And they just kind of walked by, they didn't even look. But other folks who had that like sweet curiosity in life, you know, they just want to see everything beautiful. They stopped and looked with me and that's who I became friends with. I'm hearing a chickadee now actually making a fuss over here. What a surprise. This is the reason they're all here. 
if you want to listen to a, a northern cardinal come in a little bit, because what I don't want to do is like totally freak this bird out. Now remember, this is one of many variations. Here's another one. Same bird? One thing that sometimes I relate um, learning bird songs to is hearing different instruments in a musical piece. So, you know, if you're listening to a symphony and, um, you know, can you tell the violin from the cello? Uh, can you, probably, right? You, you know, unless the cello is really high pitched and the violin's really low. Uh, but how about like the French horn from the oboe? Probably. You know, like what we're doing a lot of times is listening for the tone, the, the quality of the sounds a bird makes more than just the pattern that it makes. Some birds have very predictable patterns. Um, the hooded warbler, or let me choose another one, black throated green warbler. It has two primary songs it sings most of the time. One of them, the mnemonic for it is Z, 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 Zuzé, Z, 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 Zuzé. The other one is Z, 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 Z. If you learn those two, you'll recognize that bird most of the time. Um, however, Carolina Wren, it might sing something different every time, or Northern Cardinal even, but you'll recognize the quality of its tone. So again, uh, I'm gonna pay, play you now one of its, oops, excuse me, one of its alarm calls. I can't even hear that, unfortunately. Here's another one. Oh. Yeah. It's just a song. <laughs> Two different males calling back and forth. They might just be conversing and catching up. They might be competing a little bit or trying to show off, you know? And, and that can really look different for different birds at different times. There's some times where like you and your buddy both have strong crushes on the same person and it's actually uncomfortable. Like you're really hoping to be chosen over the other person. Or there's other times where like guys are just walking down the street hoping they look good to anyone who looks, you know? So it might be really friendly and even a bonding thing for birds. <laughs> Like, am I projecting human culture onto the birds right now? Yeah, I totally am. But, but what I'm trying to emphasize is that um, we need to be careful with blanket meanings about when we say, oh, those birds are definitely competing because there's two males singing. It could be quite a variety of experiences for those two birds. They could be old chums that are just out singing together, out for a night. Uh, it may or may not be aggressive. And the way to learn that is by watching the individuals for a while, both getting to know the species and what's typical for that species or not, as well as getting to know the individuals and what's typical for the individual or not. Okay, so I'm gonna play you the ZZZ Zuzé song of the black-throated green warbler. And again, this is a variation that's a little different than what I typically hear. I find that really common with iBird Pro. It's hard for me to find what I hear most of the time here. Um, little tease of like a specific place. I, I can't help, they do, with so many birds, I find that with iBird Pro, that I think that they maybe went out of their way to find unusual things. Because often, like uh, Autobahn, I could find, that this is that second call, the Z, 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 Z. Oh, and then Z, 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 Z. Going back and forth. Now, I wonder if it's two different birds. This is the black throated green warbler, a woodland species that's very abundant. I think I actually heard one here just on Wednesday coming from somewhere over there. They're common in the woods. During spring, it's one of the birds I'll tally the most of if I'm in the woodland habitats. Yeah, not so much in the suburbs though. You'd have to have a big chunk of woods before you get black throated green. Yeah. Uh, let's mosey down the road a little bit. One of the things I've really appreciated about this group is you all are like super tuned in and I can feel like that there's like quietness inside you, which, which is great. That's not always the case. I teach a lot of different groups and sometimes folks have trouble quieting down and tuning in. I grew up in Washington, D.C. I grew up in the city and I grew up in an environment where I had to regularly practice tuning noises out. If I want it to feel peaceful, if I want it to sleep well, if I want it to just have a good conversation with a friend, 
I had to practice not hearing things. Yeah. When we get into connecting with our landscape, when we get into connecting with natural ecosystems and habitats and trying to see what's here, we're, we're going to do the opposite of that. We're going to try to put our ears on every noise we hear. And that's, that's a completely different thing for our minds and our senses to do, is to open the gates. Um, a lot of times we need to do that to some extent anyway, right? Just for safety, we need to be able to hear, is there a car coming? At one point in our lives uh, and in our uh, ancestry, in our history, not that long ago, we wanted to hear if there were any predators nearby. And uh, I just spent a year out in California and had two active mountain lions on the land that I was living on. That was nice for that. I also went down looking for black panthers in Florida a few years ago. Actually, I was mostly looking for birds, but I really wanted to see a black panther. Um, right, and, and they can be here too, absolutely. Well, I went down to Panther Pond, one of the areas with the highest black panther population. And I was looking for crested kirkaras and a number of fun birds. Um, I, I was interested in seeing a panther, but you know how it is with like a big predator cat. You like want to see it from far away. And I had walked around already for two hours early in the morning before I came to the first sign near the campsite where I had camped. Because I, I got in late at night, I didn't read the sign first. And there was a big sign that was like, warning, black panthers are active in this area. Don't walk alone. Consider not, work, not walking at dawn and dusk. That's when I was, that's when I was walking. Um, if you see a cat, make yourself look big, make lots of noise. And then the last thing it said is, if it attacks, fight back. And I was like, oh my goodness. I just want to tell you, I was already tuned into sound because I was listening and looking for birds. But can you imagine how much more heightened my senses got on my like half an hour walk back to my campsite? I was like, wow, lots and lots of things like to eat birds, right? Another cat bird over here just went, Meah. you all hear that? Lots of things would love to eat a cat bird, especially cats. Most of our songbirds are used to the fact that they, they are on the menu for raccoons and snakes and weasels and foxes and other birds, and, you know, the owls and, and the occipiters, the sharpshin and the cooper's hawk. Um, there's all kinds of things, cats, dogs, humans, right? For thousands of years, humans have been eating songbirds. Matter of fact, most of the time when we scare these little birds, they fly a certain distance and a certain height away from humans that's particular to humans. And it's about the distance they need to be for a human to not be able to throw a rock accurately at them. Yeah. So, so one thing for us to know is that these birds have to be aware of potential predation almost every instant, almost all the time, every day. And that is one of the ways that we as humans, as we tune into the birds, we can start to get a sense of what's going on in the landscape. When that Cooper's hawk flew over, did you all hear the quiet? There was one bird that kept singing, but everything else was quiet. I'm going to guess, by the way, that that bird kept singing for a very particular reason. It was one of the birds that was closest to us, and it was using us as what's called a bubble of safety. It was basically being like, I'm betting that Cooper's hawk won't come close to that group of birders. They got like equipment and like lenses and like that Cooper's hawk's probably not going to. So it was using us as, as this, this safety area. Uh, by being close with us, but almost all the other birds just went, Phew. let's go towards these Canada geese. Red shoulder hawk is in flight, coming above us. Its shoulders are a warm chestnut rufous color. And one of the things that helped me with an identification feature is when it took off, um, there was a little bright patch on the ends of its wings, and they're what we call windows. For some reason with the red shoulder hawk, it's very common for them. Most of the time, they'll have a little thinning in where their primary feathers meet their secondary feathers, uh, wing feathers, and a little bit of light shines through. I'll go ahead and play a red shoulder. But interesting that it, it took off off of that fence and when it flew, it flew towards us, which is this is the same spot those other two red shoulders flew to before. And actually I hear a blue jay in the background almost imitating Ron. Blue jays love to imitate hawks, and some of them are quite skilled at it. Here's one of them. Yeah. No, this is a red shoulder hawk. 
But boy, Blue Jay can do this really well. Well, I just want to mention both the Canada goose and the mallard and, and just bring waterfowl in. Um, we're coming to a different habitat. Uh, there's a couple little inlets here. There is definitely other waterfowl that we might see here too. This would be a great spot for green herons. I could sure imagine a common yellow throat. I'll show you pictures of these birds later uh, in the, the afternoon. Common yellow throat would love the thickets along the water here. Um, and then we have an example of a goose in a uh, dabbling duck. American robin flying by there. Dabbling ducks, the mallards that we just saw uh, floating away from us, uh, rather than diving under the water and going down way to the bottom for vegetation, instead they're just going for shallow stuff. And dabbling ducks, as dabblers, their feet are a little more forward. It means they don't have good propulsion when they're diving into the water. A diving duck has its feet all the way at the back and it does a really good job of pushing it so it can go deep. Some birds dive hundreds of feet. I think loons can go more than 200 feet deep, which is just like unbelievable to me. But they have their feet way far in the back, so much so that walking for them is almost impossible. And they have long bodies that torpedo themselves down. These dabbling ducks, they want it to be able to have some ability to walk on land, so their feet are a little more forward. It means they're not so good at diving. Got a little bit of a sprinkle happening here. Um, not so good at diving. Instead, they just do this little tip-up thing, right? You ever seen mallards or other ducks do that? Their butts go way up in the air, and they're just nibbling at something that's in the shallow waters, and then they pop back up. Watch ducks a lot, and you'll see that they have methods for being safe while this is happening, usually at least one duck of a bunch will stay up while the others are dabbling down. Somebody is keeping a lookout, yeah? Um, sometimes in our area, especially on bigger lakes, we get a bird called an American widgeon, and that is a duck that spends most of its life stealing from other ducks. They wait for a diving duck to go down like a, a, a gadwall go down and get some vegetation from the bottom. And the other duck will bring the vegetation up to the surface. The American widgeon will grab that greenery, the vegetation from the other duck and eat it. For a long time, there was some speculation about like, it seems like the other ducks tolerate it quite a bit. What's that about? It almost, in some cases, it looks like they're feeding the American widgeon. Why would they do that? And uh, some ornithologists spent some time with it and were able to show that the American widgeons were actually doing the same thing. They were keeping watch. They would stay up at the top and they would be able to warn other ducks when there were predators coming from above so that the other ducks, when they first pop up, they're really vulnerable so that they would know. Uh, I don't know how they did it, but I thought it was neat that they had worked out some kind of deal for that. So American widgeons, uh, not real common up here in the mountains, mostly because lakes aren't real common in the mountains. So here come some adult Canada geese. Notice that the Canada geese that had young uh, ducklings with them, they took off. They were like, we don't know what y'all are up to. We're out of here. We want to protect our ducklings. But the adults here look pretty comfortable. They're cruising around. Looks like a couple of them are flirting. Some are looking for food. Uh, one of them has its head up right now, walking towards us. Now they're all down. If we were to go a little bit closer, we would see some very uh, predictable goose behavior, which is as soon as we got anywhere near them, one of them, uh, probably a dominant or older goose in the bunch, would keep its head up and it would stare at us. And if we continued to move towards them, it would go from head up to really good posture. It would actually move its head very straight up and give us a look. It would be like right in your eyes. And the other birds, even if they were down eating, would notice that out of the corner of their eyes as they're down nibbling, they would notice that that other duck went from like this to like that. And then if that one goose, if we kept going in their direction, we didn't change course, it would just make one little, little goose noise. And immediately probably all the birds would either quickly walk away or fly away if they felt like the threat was enough. So just to know that there's a constant alarm system going on. You can avoid that alarm system entirely, by the way, by how slowly you walk, what you're up to. 
We'll talk about the honoring routine later, but there's little things you can do that let other creatures, not just birds, but birds and other animals know that, um, that you're, that you're okay, that you're comfortable, that you're in baseline behavior. Matter of fact, if you stopped and, and ate some chickweed or some wild violets and were nibbling on stuff and like didn't look at them, like looked in the other direction, they'd be like, huh, maybe he's not hunting. Maybe he's just out gathering chickweed, you know? Go, so I just really just wanted to see the canoe or something like that. Then that would also send a different message. In some ways, it's just common sense, yeah? Like, like how do you feel when you're in a public park sitting at a table and someone is walking across the field who you don't know directly towards you? It makes a different feeling than if someone is walking, you know, sideways or perpendicular to you or diagonal, you know, they might be going over there. So birds are very tuned into that kind of piece. Um, Canada goose, um, just to mention, is a long distance migrant. It happens to be one of our birds that um, migrates by sight. And rather than doing what a lot of this small songbirds do, which is migrate at night using constellations or stars, a lot of songbirds use a combination of magnetic field actually and constellations. The Canada goose is primarily using visual cues. It's memorizing the path. So it has to have ancestors for its life to work. It has to follow the family group all the way down to Central America or, or however far they're heading for their summer, excuse me, their winter time home. Um, they're gonna learn the route. So you can imagine if I asked you to walk down to Costa Rica and come back this week, next year, this time, you know, um, you would have to memorize the route down and back up. And luckily your first time going down, there'd be someone to show you the way. That's super helpful, right? If I was just like, go for it, no compass, no Siri, you know, like none, none of that stuff. Um, but if someone showed you the way and told you, you have to know this because I might not make it through this winter, it might be on you. You know, you would learn the route and be able to walk it backwards back to, to the same pond uh, that you came to last year, if it was an enjoyable pond last year, you'll probably come back to the same spot. Especially if you had uh, breeding success, if your young made it through, um, then you're gonna come back to the same location likely. Pretty remarkable. Uh, by the way, if those birds, if some Canadian geese um, get sick or, or separate it from the group and they don't know the way, Usually what Canada Goose will do is they'll send a couple folks who do know the way down with the birds who are sick. Um, and so they'll be able to fly together as a group. They're just very community oriented birds. Um, however, if, if a bird or two birds got separated who didn't actually know the way, well, Canada geese actually have enough survival skill. They can stay here in the winter time. And because they won't have learned the route, um, they might just become localized birds. If there's a water source like a park or, or I see them sometimes in graveyards or, or uh, other locations that have water, um, sometimes Canada goose will just become localized birds and they'll stay as a local flock and they'll never migrate. And usually that flock will last and do pretty well, um, probably until some predator finds them, right? Once the fox finds that group, then they're, they're in trouble. If they don't have another pond to go to, they might be well, it's sitting geese in this case. It's actually the males that are lower in pitch and the females are higher in pitch and they often call back and forth and back and forth to each other. By the way, sometimes the group of the family group of birds coming back are able to find the two who got lost last year and they'll reunite and join the group again and, and then they'll become migrants. So. So the red shoulder hawk is probably not looking for a gosling, uh, probably not even baby birds. Red shoulder hawk is in a group of hawks called buteos. And in our area, the common buteos are red shoulder hawk, broad wing hawk, and red tail hawk. Those are bigger hawks and they spend a lot of time just riding on, on air drafts. We've got a red bellied woodpecker flying over. And they're mostly hunting rodents, reptiles, and amphibians. Rarely will they take a songbird. Primarily rodents, reptiles, and amphibians. 
And I am almost certain that it was sitting on that fence looking over the field for rodents. I don't think it was interested. Uh, the geese would have made such a fuss. And these geese are big, powerful birds. I mean, they can actually punch with their heads uh, and they will hiss and go after anything that tries to get them. You know, maybe a hawk could take a gosling. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't rule it out, but I, I have a hunch he was looking for voles and mice in, in the field. What are the main predators for the goslings? Oh, um, snapping turtles, coyotes, foxes, humans. Yeah. We had a, a red-tailed hawk in Oklahoma that would land in our yard and catch guinea fowl with his claw and kill him and eat. Oh, wow, yeah. I was just blown away because I didn't think that a red-tailed hawk would tackle a bird that big. Yeah. Uh, so it, was, it caught me completely off guard. Red-tailed hawks have taken some of my bigger chickens before. Yeah. They're pretty amazing predators. Yeah, geese are tough. Swans. Super, super tough bird, oh my goodness. I think I just heard a yellow-billed cuckoo. Now the call it was doing was um, like a which is known as its rain crow song, which often it does just before a thunderstorm. So we might not want to hang out for too long. One thing about yellow-billed cuckoos is they tend to perch in one spot for a long time. So with other birds, what I'll be doing is using my wide angle vision, waiting until I see movement. And then when I see movement, okay, I just saw a bird land on that branch. I'm gonna go like that. And I've practiced doing this over and over and over. And I'm gonna mention that more uh, practices that you can do to get, get sharp on birding. That's the number one thing though. And, and what I'd love for you to do is walk out into your yard or if you take your dog on a walk or you just want to go for a walk yourself and practice choosing small objects actually at first start a little bigger and then go smaller and smaller and just try to put your binoculars on as fast as possible so i'm just going to choose a leaf i'm going to choose a license plate i'm going to choose a rock and i'm just going to choose an object and see how quickly I can get it in my binoculars and my binoculars correctly focused on them. It sounds a little silly. I guarantee you, the more you do it, the faster you'll get at it. It's not that hard of a thing to practice too. It just takes like diligence. And when that happens, when you get good at doing that, all of a sudden at some point, a yellow-billed cuckoo will fly into a branch. It will stop. You'll have a half a second to put your binoculars on it. You'll get it in focus enough to see it was a yellow bill and not a black bill cuckoo, and then it might fly away. That might be your look at a cuckoo for the year. Um, it's not that that's what birding is all about, but sometimes it's really nice to know which bird it was that sat for just a second. You know, I, I had a nice experience with the black pole warbler, uh, one of the long distance migrates that goes way up to Northern Canada, and it flew into a yard in West Asheville, and I just happened to get the one moment when it stopped, and then it flew and I didn't see the bird again, and I was like, oh, yeah. Luckily, two others ended up coming to that yard and spending about five days there uh, a couple weeks later, but I didn't know that at the time, so I was really happy to see a black bull warbler. Let's, let's go ahead and mosey back in. Um, uh, well, questions, comments, thoughts on, on geese or mallards or, or wetland areas? What was that third bootio that you mentioned the, besides the red tail and the red? Broadwing hawk, yeah, would be our, our third common. And then yes, yellow bill cuckoo is a bird that I thought I heard here for a minute. I know, yeah, they're not real common here. And because they just stay in one place, it can be hard. If you just watch that tree for an hour, maybe it moves once. So it's going to be hard to get your eyes on it. And they're really good at like getting right here, right? It's like... They, they know exactly where you are and they're gonna hide behind something else and have that leaf right in front of them. And so you might get to see their long tail hanging out. You can identify the two species by the tail, by the way, um, but you know, it'd be nice to get a better look than that. Um, why, don't I, why don't I play it for you? Because my imitation, yeah. Um, both of the cuckoos have coos that they do Coo, 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 coo. The yellow bill tends to do longer series, usually of, of eight or nine or 10. Uh, the black bill cuckoo tends to do fours and fives and is a little faster. Um, it can be hard to tell them apart just by that. 
But the yellow bill cuckoo has this other song, this alternate song. Yeah. Very distinct. Oh, yeah, okay. Mm. Garble. Anybody want to try to imitate that? <laughs> oh. There you go. Wow, wow that was excellent. <laughs> Keep them with you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I was like, oh, you're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Tricksters. All right, let's mosey back. Again, we're hearing Song Sparrow, of course, the Canada geese. Who's excited about 